Hello, and welcome back to our afternoon session. Um, you know, this morning we had the chance to hear from Jody Gadez and David Ragland about really some of the fundamentals of the relationship between truth and justice, the role of repair, the role of healing. And it's actually a conversation that we'll have the chance to continue this afternoon, which is wonderful. It's really a natural transition where this afternoon we'll get to explore some specific models of truth, healing, and transformation. Um, and we'll get to look sort of at examples that are embedded both at the community level and certain cultural contexts. And then we'll also have a chance to look at some institutional level organizations. And we're so fortunate today to be joined by um, Charles Chavez um, and Sandy Whitehawk and who have a lot of experience on this topic. Um, and so we're fortunate that they're here and they'll be able to share their work with us. Thank you so much for your time today. And we'll, I'll just give an, I'll, I'll offer a brief introduction. Really, we want to hear more from you guys than from me, but I'll just offer a brief introduction about, so we get a sense of, of all the wonderful work that you guys are engaged in. But so we're lucky to have Sandra Whitehawk today with us, who's a Sichangu Lakota adoptee from the Rosebud Reservation in South Dakota. And She's the founder and director of First Nations Repatriation, Repatriation Institute, which is the first organization of its kind, whose goal is to create a resource for First Nations people impacted by foster care or adoption to return home, reconnect and reclaim their identity. And the Institute also serves as a resource to enhance the knowledge and skills of practitioners who are serving First Nations people. And Sandy also organizes truth, healing, reconciliation community forums that bring together adoptees slash fostered individuals and their families and professionals, really with a goal to identify post-adoption issues and to identify strategies that will prevent the removal of First Nations children. And so Sandy's coming up to us from the Twin Cities area. And then Dr. Charles Chavez is, is the founding director of the John Mitchell Jr. Program for History, Justice and Race at George Mason University's Jimmy and Rosalind Carter School for Peace and Conflict Resolution, where he's also an assistant professor of conflict analysis, resolution and history. He serves as the vice chair for the Maryland Lynching Truth and Reconciliation Commission. He's a historian and a museum educator by training and his scholarship centers on the legacy of racial violence, interracial activism, and social justice in the United States. And he's also the author of a forthcoming book, The Silent Shore, The Lynching of Matthew Williams and the Politics of Racism in the Free State. So that's definitely a book we wanna keep our eyes out for. But thank you again so much for joining us this afternoon. And you know, of course, you guys are focused on different projects, but there's so much overlap between your work. So we want to give the space for you guys to be able to share what your work is. So I'll sort of have the conversation go back and forth, but also please jump in as you feel you want to. Sandy, I'll start with you. Really, you know, there, there's, I don't know that there's a lot of, that there's necessarily widespread knowledge about the removal of Native American children from their tribes and their community. I wonder if you can give a little bit of that historical context and then also share more about the work that you're doing around truth, healing, and, and transformation. Greetings and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm so glad to be here. I'm excited anytime that we get to talk about um, adoption, even though that sounds crazy because I don't like adoption. But anyway, um, so I was adopted out when I was 18 months old. It returned to my family when I was 35. And after healing in many areas of the complexities of adoption uh, was shown that I had this, uh, given this work that I could develop around uh, healing, uh, bringing our relatives back to our communities, uplifting and uh, nurturing our birth relatives who, you know, the ones who gave us life and the grandparents and how, how could we do that? Cause I certainly didn't wake up one day and just say, wow, I just want this to be my life's work. One, when I finally got to a point in my life where 
I didn't need or want anything. There was no trauma cloud following me around anymore. Life was just good. I had a good job that had retirement and all the things that, that I was sober. No, and uh, life was good. I just didn't need anything. And then I saw at our annual gathering something that made me realize, or I know annual gathering back home in South Dakota, that we could be welcoming our relatives back. Because one of the things that Native Americans do when they're looking for relatives is they'll go to our social gatherings because that's where you'll find people. And we've been doing that. I just realized you asked a question about how did this even happen, but we've been doing that since we were removed systematically starting in the 40s. So right after boarding school, which really broke down our identity, which really, uh, created a lot of uh, complex trauma, which we didn't even realize that's what was ha had happened. And these individuals gave birth to this next generation, which by the 50s, 60s, and 70s, a systematic removal of us. It was so systematic that here's an example of how it came to be. Um, there's a Potawatomi reservation in Michigan where <clears throat> um, the way the parents in the 50s were supporting themselves was harvesting pulp wood in the nearby forests, like just hundreds of feet away from their home. Um, but they would go out in pairs, you know, the mom and the dad, and leave the older children with the younger children. Social services knew of this and went in and within one day took nearly every child out of that small community, charged the parents with child neglect. And this happened across the country. And I heard this as a firsthand account from someone who experienced that. She was 11 years old when it happened. And here she was a retired individual, had moved back home to that community and was still saying, I wish I would have never opened the door. Because of that, her and her siblings were taken. <clears throat> she, and I, you know, I told her, I said that you were 11. They would have barged in. You didn't do anything. And so we have this collective wound in our communities as a result of this systematic removal. We, children were removed from homes because deemed too many people in the home. Um, just no electricity, no running water and targeted for removal. And it was so, so systematic that um, women went to Congress or went to uh, testify legislature, legislative hearings, and eventually the Indian Child Welfare Act was passed in 1978. People think that this is a race-based law, but it is not a race-based law. Native Americans have a political status with the United States. And so this is based on our status as sovereign nations. <clears throat> so within that, uh, so adoptions or removals slowed down some, but we're on an uptick again and targeted by adoption agencies who are always trolling for young women in duress pregnancies and uh, offering this adoption solution. So that's how that began. And as I learned more about what had happened to us as a people in this area and realizing at our annual gatherings that we're not doing what we could be doing, which is welcome our relatives back, nurture our care, our life givers, and begin to heal this collective wound. So that started it, and then that came to be what I do today. Thank you so much, Sandy. And we'll have the chance to explore more what it looks like what you do, but I also want to bring Charles into the conversation a little bit. So Charles is the scope of your work, right? It, well, it's multilateral, but I was wondering if you could initially just share with us some of the work that you're doing um, around the truth, racial healing and transformation, the national movement to try to get a, a, a national level truth and truth commission around the legacy of slavery. And you can obviously explain that better, but if you wanna explain the history of that work and also a little bit more about that work. Yes, thank you so much for this opportunity, May um, and uh, PJ, as well as to Sandy. Thank you so much for sharing this space with me. I'm honored to be on a panel with individuals such as yourself. Um, yes, I can talk briefly about it. I'm a really a relative newcomer to this overall movement is what I would call it. 
I uh, like to call the USTRHT movement, a movement of movements. Um, in many ways, people on the ground um, have been doing this work. Individuals like Sandy and others have been doing this work at local as well as um, national levels through various organizations. Um, but our goal um, was to really begin to leverage the local movements that are already existing and have these movements coalesce and come together to support the establishment of a national truth commission. Um, and in many ways, we see that um, a lot of the issues um, regarding America, um, one of the major issues is the fact that we, in some ways, feel that we're better than other countries, um, specifically around these issues. Um, and if um, other countries um, have established truth commissions, we feel that uh, America should follow suit and establish a unique truth commission that is designed based on confronting um, America's own unique um, foundational flaws and issues, specifically the issues of um, racism, sexism, and anti-Blackness. Um, and that is really the, the um, foundation and of the U.S. Truth Commission. That is the focus, to really confront the systemic injustices um, that continue to show themselves in the various outcomes that we are all, all reminded of on a daily basis. Um, I mean, to, 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 to this day, even with COVID-19, um, it's really not a surprise to marginalized communities, um, people of color, color um, Black people, or even Native Americans, specifically around issues of health disparities, right? Anytime there's a health crisis, um, there's always um, disparities specifically in regards to communities of color. Um, and I think um, it didn't have, shouldn't take COVID-19 for America to realize the importance of um, dealing with these systemic issues. And so this movement started um, really with the work of Dr. Gail Christopher, um, her work with the Kellogg Foundation and in studying and surveying and working with their team then at the Kellogg Foundation with over 200 partners um, nationally, different organizations, um, she developed a framework um, that is uniquely designed to combat and deal with um, America's systemic issues. Um, um, and of course, there was a work done in assessing and looking at various truth commissions. Um, obviously, one of the major truth commissions that come to mind when, when we talk about truth commissions is the TRC in South Africa. Um, however, to my earlier point, it's important that America has adopts a framework that really is uniquely its own um, and really confronts those systemic um, original sins, if you will, of, um, to my point, um, racism, specifically um, the treatment of na uh, mistreatment of a Native Americans, but also um, sexism, but and, and also equally anti-Blackness. Um, these are the things that separate um, the, the, our commission from other commissions nationally, um, specifically internationally, specifically as it relates to um, dealing with systemic injustices. Um, and we've, we've made a lot of headway. Um, we're working with um, Congresswoman Barbara Lee, as well as Cory Booker to um, establish, um, working towards establishing a truth commission, getting support in Congress. Um, what most, one of the misnomers around the truth commission is that this, some, this commission is some way getting in the way of reparations. Um, that is something that we seek to dispel. We support the reparations movement holistically, um, but we feel that um, we have to, it's more than just reparations. There has to be systemic change. And, um, a number of individuals from other marginalized communities can attest to um, what happens when you only get, what happens after reparations. We, we have other examples nationally um, throughout our country's history, specifically with Japanese Americans, as well as some capacity Native Americans around reparations and issues. And there are still lingering issues that continue because we believe that these issues are systemic. And um, it's so easy for the government, um, governments across the world to offer band-aids and to um, provide, you know, temporary resources um, to deal with injustices. Um, but there has to be real systemic change. Otherwise, um, these things are going to continue to um, develop and continue to reemerge years later. And this is why we um, talk about, uh, when we think about this historic um, strides that we've made in the US, specifically around um, 
it, reparations, but also around symbols of justice and symbols of policy change like civil rights acts, et cetera. This is why we still see the same type of situations reemerging over and over again. It's because we, we believe that we've yet to deal with the root um, and we feel that until we deal with the root and address these systemic foundational issues, then the outcomes are going to continue to be the same. Um, and so that's kind of a background. We haven't given up the fight. We are um, really in a unique phase. Um, I'm also the vice chair of the Maryland Lynching Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And this um, commission really is modeled after the um, US TRHT framework and we are the first um, national commission in US history to focus specifically on at the state level, um, investigating racial terror lynchings. And you may have heard about um, some of this work briefly with the recent announcement of the pardoning of 34 um, lynching victims um, from, the, from Governor um, Hogan this past week. And so we've been in the news a lot, our work has been in the news a lot, but we wanna make sure, um, and we've also received a request, and this is an exclusive for you all from the White House to um, figure out how we were able to really pull this commission off and look at the ways in which we can implement this at the national level. Before I transition back, I think I wanted to make one major point is that the, this work in regards to truth telling and model, the models that we're all looking, looking towards, this work has been going on for years. Um, if not hundreds of years in communities who have always, who have in many ways have not given up on um, the true um, potential of America. However, what has changed and what moment we are at now, um, we are asking America to meet these, meet us halfway. And we're asking the government to meet us halfway. And I think we have a unique opportunity in a moment to do that. But um, the work will continue in the communities at the local level, regardless of what America does. But we hope um, at, this, uh, at this moment in history that America will reach down and begin to meet us halfway so that we can make systemic change. Thank you so much for sharing that. And uh, you both really have experience with state level truth commissions. And maybe before we even hear more about the scope of those commissions, like, you've both already touched on sort of like the key elements of truth and healing and the relationship that that has. Um, I was wondering if you could explore some more about like, what is this movement from truth to healing? Like, what is the connection between these two ideas? What is their connection to justice? And, and what does this look like in the work that you're doing? And Sandy, I'll start with you and then I'll, I'll move to you, Charles. Well, when I started, our circles, it was 2006. And I was always talking about truth and reconciliation at that time until I visited Crow Creek Reservation. Uh, we were invited to come and speak with some elders there that my mentor and teacher, uh, Chris Leith, who is no longer uh, in this realm with us. Um, we we're beginning the work that I described earlier, welcoming our relatives back. How do we do this in our community? And this elder spoke up and she's, and I wish to this day, I do not know who her, who she was. And I asked my friend who was there. I said, which grandma said that? She can't remember. <laughs> so, but she said to me, don't speak of truth and reconciliation without talk, without taking time for healing. If healing doesn't take place, no reconciliation is going to take place. So we thought about that a lot. She said in 1999, I, th I want to say it's Governor Rounds. I might have that incorrect, but the governor of South Dakota in that year made that year the year of reconciliation, hoping to improve relationships with the uh, tr 11 tribes in South Dakota. And she said, nobody came here to talk to us, to hear our, our experiences. She said, nothing happened. No reconciliation took place here. That said a lot to me about how we use these words. And so um, I started saying, because of that uh, suggestion from her, I started saying truth, healing, reconciliation. And then that upset people, because what am I, am I purporting that I'm a healer? What is this? Oh, we just went through all kinds of stuff with that. But I just stayed strong in what that grandma said. And she, what she said is the truth. And so the community 
what I've always, what I believe and what I learned in, in going forward and, and having our circles is the community, you, you know, you don't go in and do it to the community. The community brings that healing energy in, in themselves. They have that within them. And the reason that healing can take place is once truth is validated by just listening, the acknowledgement, the nodded head, the um, speaking it into the air so that it's not in your body anymore. Um, so it's not ruminating around there uh, and to then have others hear it and, and they go, oh, that happened to me and I never told anybody either. So that's the healing part that begins the healing and the healing is then, you know, it doesn't have a timeline. It's a lifetime um, continuum of healing deeper all, as we go along. So um, then along the way, as we started just standing strong and saying truth, healing, reconciliation, then people were upset about the word reconciliation. And when I say people, I mean our people, our Native people. I, I don't know nothing about anybody else. I just know what my community does. They were like, we're not going to talk about reconciliation. We don't need to reconcile. Things were done to me. It wasn't me. And, and just say stuff like that. And I go, yeah, that's true. That's true. It should be truth, healing, justice, or truth and justice, truth and this and truth and that. And I'm a, I just went, okay, make it what you want. There's nobody saying you have to call it anything other than what speaks to your community. And you don't have to attack me for saying reconciliation. <laughs> no, I didn't say that, but I was like, but that's how painful this is. You know, people don't mean, I don't think they mean to be attacking it's just that there's it's so raw it's so raw see i guess my part of my message is you got to be ready to take a few hits that have nothing to do with you and just move on and know that it's not about you so in the not wanting to have the reconciliation um i kind of giggle to myself though because i think it's still reconciliation it's justice um there I, I don't know i just think it all comes together you know, I've heard people say, well, we were never reconciled. So how can we be reconciled? And just getting really into that. And I'm thinking, can we just start with the healing or the truth part? And we'll get, and then that definition will come because what you do when you go into a community and what you think is going to be the outcome is not the outcome. That outcome cannot be predicted. The thing I will always predict is healing will take place. I don't know if the community is ready to go forward beyond that. Maybe they will be, maybe they won't be. But nevertheless, it started. And that's what's important. And uh, the, it, when, when, our, when we have not been listened to or heard for so long, and we finally get this opportunity, it just brings up so much stuff all over. And um, that's, that's just part of that. So. I still say in the work I do, I still call it reconciliation. I'm not cemented to that word. But one of the things I do know from my own experience in doing these circles is that it begins with me. When we were first doing our circles, I found my dialogue, my inner dialogue was one of judgment and prejudice and like when white social workers in our circles, when white social workers would start crying and feeling bad, I think, good, you should feel bad. And I'd have all this horrible, you know, knowing you don't get to talk either. It's just, you know, I didn't say that, but inside. Until I saw, and people will still say that this is not an example, but I say, you weren't there and I know it was. But we were in a circle, uh, we had small circles for this one gathering that we had and was mostly foster youth, age 12, uh, 13 to 17. Um, and we, part of our day was doing work within small circles. So one of our small circles, we asked our youth to share one thing they wanted a social worker to know. Because we thought if we did that, or you know, we found that doing that, it informed social workers to help make better decisions. And so this young man shared his experience of being in foster care most of his life. It was interesting that he had all these experiences of abuse, you know, neglect, uh, maybe even starvation in some settings. 
He said, but the thing that hurt me the most, the thing that really bothered me the most was that on my birthday, I would ask the social worker who, whichever social worker I had, I'd say, I want to talk to my mom on my birthday. And no social worker ever did that. Meanwhile, across from the young man, this social worker's shoulders are just starting to go up and down and she is like full on weeping. And uh, eventually, you know, I, I asked her first if she's okay, because I mean, physically, she was just vomiting, <laughs> emotionally vomiting. And um, she just looked up at him and she said, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I've done this. I've done this. I've done this. And, and um, she said, I just now I don't know what to do. You know, and she wept and we let her have her moment. And we went back to the young man and had conversation but that young man eventually stood up took a few steps across that circle put his hand on her shoulder and he goes now you know and he went back and sat down now people will say be critical and say he shouldn't have had to teach her i mean all kinds of things right well it is what it is it in that moment that young man's story was not a story it was a testimony and it was validated and it gave him a sense of, it wasn't like an overprotection of the social worker. We didn't switch our focus and take care of her. You know, we did what was right by her. And um, she said, you know, I, I vowed to do things differently. So that's just an example of what can happen in the kinds of circles, one of the kinds of circles that we do. and. Um, I, that's where transformation happens, right? So that young man's gift to that circle was the importance of connection to his family, which is what we know is what we all need. Um, and the fact that he said it in the way that he did, uh, I think that's a really powerful experience. It taught me a lot because I was judging that social worker throughout that encounter. The young man didn't, he, he stepped out of himself and just said, now you know, now you know what to do and just sat back down. It really taught me that I had to put all my stuff aside and not think I'm in control or that I know what someone's process is. And so um, that's what it is. That's what I've seen. I've seen it over and over. And I've seen at the end of our circles, Workers say this will forever change how I advocate for Native children because of what they heard. Most people don't understand or know and have a deeper understanding. Thank you so much. And Charles, I want to bring you in also because I know you're th you also think about these exact same things. I believe you're actually responsible for the reconciliation for the Maryland lynching Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And I know you think about this question of reconciliation and explore all these questions. So please share. Yes, sure. Thank you so much for that, Sandy. You opened up an age-old debate in many ways around this using this term, you know, reconciliation and what it means. And you know, we are a commission that has rec reconciliation in our title, but we do wrestle with that as well in terms of the work that we're doing. But I think you made an amazing point, specifically around having the community be able to name that process um, and having the community to be able to um, really um, be guided. Um, by their experiences. And the first thing to your point, I think is so central that I agree with you holistically on is the truth portion and moving from the truth portion, centering that truth portion, specifically the individual and community-based truth. Um, and then from there moving towards this racial healing, which I think um, for us in terms of our framework, one of the main things that we um, utilize specifically within the framework is um, our racial healing circles. And the goal of these racial healing circles are to pull out the shared humanity that in many ways, um, media, um, technology and other, you know, forces and um, tools have um, allowed um, this dehumanization to emerge. Um, so when we see individuals, um, and this is all part of our history, um, this hypersaturation with anti-Black and racist violence um, and policy. It's kind of like a part of what we've become used to um, in many ways. And I speak specifically to the um, recent 
um, and ongoing anti-Black violence as it relates to police brutality. When we see these things over and over again, um, I, I talked about this following the Derek Chauvin um, verdict, specifically the ways in which during the trial we, we got to see, America got to see again what you know, many of us saw, um, specifically um, people in the 1950s with Emmett Till and others, when their Blackness was on trial, right? When um, it, it, the crime really didn't matter, their humanity didn't matter. And that was um, the justice system in many ways yeah, was on display and it has historically failed people of color. And I think what we end up doing is dehumanizing these individuals over and over again um, by trying to, to Audre Lorde's point, utilize the master's tools. Um, and what I mean by that specifically is the ways in which we approach justice in this country. Um, and so for me, something that I think is extremely essential is having the community at the center and involved in the process throughout. Um, and I think for us, um, with the US Commission working towards that, but also with the Maryland Commission, engaging with the local coalitions and people who have been doing this work before there was ever a thought of a state commission or even of a national commission. Um, we have to first engage those communities. We have to allow them to share their truth um, and then work towards um, the remedies that they believe that their people deserve. Um, and I think um, for us, that is the approach that we're taking. It has been very, it's been, it's been quite difficult again, because our institutions are not shaped in this manner, right? We have, we have issues of paternalism um, that we, we wrestle with as a, in terms of our institutions. And oftentimes the government or state or even local municipalities want to tell marginalized groups and communities how they ought to um, obtain their freedom how they should go about it. Um, but for me, what, what we miss in all of this is, what the root to all of this is, is really dismantling the lie, um, specifically around this hierarchy of human value. That is our biggest um, obstacle and goal, and that's what we have to really center on. And we have to be able to highlight the humanity um, in individuals, um, because really, that's the only way we can talk, really move towards racial healing. Until people, when they look at George Floyd or hear Breonna Taylor or hear about what um, happening at Standing Rock or in rural areas of North Carolina around environmental issues and things like that, until they're able to see themselves within the struggles of people who don't look like them, then we're, we're going to have a difficult path towards racial healing. And, you know, we've already started talking about um, the, the Truth Commission in, in Maryland, but also, Sandy, you were also a commissioner on a state level Truth Commission, the Maine Wabanaki State Child Welfare Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about that experience, how that Truth Commission came about, and then, yes, yeah, what, what was sort of took place with that commission. First, I have to say, I really appreciate um, Charles's comment about um, individuals seeing themselves in people that don't look like them. Our shared humanity, uh, as he said, that's what our circles really generate is breaking down uh, that, that barrier of the us and them. When people see each other heart to heart, there are very few, the sad part is the very few people who refuse to engage in that are the people in most often in power of situations that's what really sucks and that's what makes it really difficult and hard to uh, penetrate that wall but I, I have hope I have hope and uh, I don't know why I have hope but I do <laughs> I think I have hope because I've watched individuals like that social worker or this other individual who said this will forever change um, uh, or, or or instructors even saying thanks to hearing this I share blah 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 book lists you know so it may not seem like it's a huge change but the very fact that there is a reparations uh, discussion um, and the work that Charles is doing is saying that there's reason for hope and the fact that we've had a truth and reconciliation commission on Indian child welfare in Maine says something so yeah, there's good reason for hope so interestingly enough we did go to maine in 2007 and did at one of our circles the community um 
there had been working for some time and had built good relationships with DHS, DHHS, and other entities in child welfare. And yet uh, there was so much more not brought to the surface. They thought a process like the, uh, a TRC could, um, well, what the because what a TRC does is formalizes. It just it's irritating and it's awesome all at once. It's just like academia. Somehow somebody talked to twenty people and wrote a paper, and ten people said, "Yeah, that's right." Then they're an expert, right? Oh, that just gets me. And so the um, that and then in the TRC, it's like we've been telling our stories all along. We've been telling and retelling and telling and retelling, and nothing happens. In fact, when I um, started planting seeds here in Minnesota for a reconciliation, uh, an elder, that's what one of the elders said to me, and she was one of the women who, when she was a young social worker, helped gather testimony for the legislative process for the passage of ICWA. And she said the only way she would participate would be if um, there was a mandate that the state would agree to address issues brought forward. So that's the difference between um, like a lot of the grassroots circles we had, we counted on people's honesty or willingness and desire to make change, which many did, but I like the mandate portion of this. So Maine had the mandate with the state of Maine and the five tribes to go through this process. So not only did um, tribal members uh, offer testimony, uh, DHH, DHHS workers, judges, uh, social workers, non-tribal, all offered their experience, their testimony, which was uh, interesting and affirming of what we've known all along. So their process was to, um, their process was to nominate individuals who uh, anybody could nominate and then from this pool of individuals I think it was 55 they chiseled it down to five commissioners and the reason that I got was able to be a commissioner partially because of the work I'd already been doing but I wasn't from Maine and the community members wanted someone who wasn't from there who didn't know anybody at an intimate level so that there would be more um I guess be more objective or 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 for those, uh, but like I received testimony from individuals who, who actually requested to just tell me because I wasn't from there and we could record, you know, their, their testimony. So the, you can go to the main, main trc.org and see their website and the ongoing work that they're doing there. But what, what the way it occurred was over 27 months, I believe, uh, we visited each tribal community and urban community and uh, received testimony. From that testimony, then we took ourselves for a couple of days and sent, put everything together and recorded our findings. And these findings can be seen on this website. And then we wrote recommendations of what we wanted them, the state and state to do. And then all those testimonies can be reviewed. They're written, they're um, taped, uh, some audio, some, um, some just voice and others with uh, face and voice at Bowdoin College in um, Portland, Maine, I believe that's where it is. So anybody can go and listen and hear as well. It was... At one point, everything went really good. And then in the very beginning, at one point, Governor LePage, is that his name, LePage, freaked out and went, oh, no, they're going to want money. <laughs> it's, um, we can't do this. No, no. We said, we already said we didn't want any money. We said we're just collecting. And then the Secretary of State was one of the commissioners. But he wasn't just Secretary of the State when he was voted in. <laughs> And he's, you know, his work didn't conflict with child welfare. He'd never heard about, you know, he had no knowledge whatsoever. So there wasn't a conflict of interest either. So it was really awesome to have someone from the government as one of the commissioners 
learning for the first time about his state things he didn't know either. So it was, it, it was one of the most incredible experiences of these individuals, some who had never shared their experience, um, being uh, courageous enough to be videotaped and to offer what happened to them, how social services had not followed the Indian Child Welfare uh, Act and what happened as a result of that. Charles, before I bring you into the conversation, Sandy, I'm wondering, there is a, so this um, commission, there's a film that was created around this commission called Don Land. Yeah. And there is a scene in the film that's very, that's the very beginning of the film where a woman, where you're having a space and a woman already starts speaking about what happened to her. I wonder if you can share a little bit about that story. So it was interesting that that woman has had shared her story before. I don't want to say, okay, let me say, when I'm in my community, I say story. When I'm not in my community, I say testimony because story means something different to Indian people than it does to the to non-Indian people. But I'm gonna just tell you if I say story, don't think of it as just a story. Think of it as this is a testimony to a wrong. Okay, so anyway, she'd been, she had shared her, her story before. Uh, in other occasions, and she was one of the women who led the initiative to bring a TRC to Maine. So she was quite active. But what happened there, um, there was another level of healing that was taking place for her right there. So in this moment where it looks like, oh my God, we should not be opening people up and having them go to this dark place, recalling what happened. And yet we had everything set in place to nurture her and take care of her and validate her. And um, which is what we did, which is why we cut the camera. Cause at some point we just said, oh, we have to, we have to just focus on her. And it was interesting. Cause I remember in the film, she says, uh, this doesn't happen. This never happened before. And meaning that emotional, that deep emotional pain. But all of those traumas and pains that we have will heal and can heal, but only if they're opened and then we're there to nurture that, to hug her, to hold her, to tell her, um, you know, you're here now just to do the reality checks and to say, it should have never happened to you. The words, you know, things, nurturing kinds of words. So, uh, but it set the tone and gave others in the community, oh, okay, we can do this and we're going to do this. And they began sharing. Um, but yeah, that's, that is one of the things too that people get afraid of. And you shouldn't go into a circle unless you know how to take care of people emotionally and spiritually. That I will say that you can't just go, oh, well, thank you for sharing that next. You know, you have to be very mindful of holding that space in a in a uh, in a way that validates, acknowledges. And uh, it's like as if someone is showing you the, the rawness on their skin because they fell on the pavement. You stop, you clean the dirt off. You know, it hurts when they're cleaning the dirt off. Maybe they need some Neosporin. Maybe they don't, but they need a band. You know, that you have to just stop and take care of that wound. Thank you for sharing. And Charles, I invite you, of course, to respond to anything that Sandy said. And I was also going to ask around the Maryland um, Commission, maybe you could share a little bit more about how it came to be. And then, of course, how the, what these principles look like in your commission. Sure. I wanted to first um, agree uh, and support what Sandy was saying, specifically around when you're developing um, opportunities for, excuse me, opportunities for communities to share their truth. Um, I think it's so important that we have the mechanisms to Sandy's point um, to support those communities mm -hmm. and also make sure that these opportunities and these spaces, um, this is something that all truth commissions in many ways have to deal with once you move to the phase of testimony, right? Because in many ways, what we don't want to talk about when we talk about restorative justice is the potential to re-traumatize these communities by the, with these experiences. 
um, specifically when we're dealing with um, historic wrongs that have produced systemic um, traumatic outcomes um, that communities are still living with. And what we don't want to do and as a commission, what we vowed to not do is to, um, in many ways, put these individuals on display and for them to share their trauma um, only with the hopes that they'll be believed this time. Um, you know, and, and this is where this whole, that's why centering on um, the local and individual and those impacted, having those at the center to um, have a have buy-in and support and really take their lead in many ways because that's something that again is counter to the way um, we operate as a government when you ask those who are oppressed and mar marginalized to um when you when we're forced to as institutions take their lead right that's counter to the ways in which our government functions in many ways right so it, it's almost as if you don't get to tell us about our people's history we'll tell you and we'll let you know what we need what resources we need if we um, need them, right? That orientation is again, counter to everything that we know in America, specifically in terms of engaging marginalized communities. And so for us, you know, we have a unique task, again, recognizing that the master's tools will not um, dismantle um, the its system, right? And so um, that's one point, but I think um, centering the well-being is, is also essential as well and having that to be a part of the process. And so when we talk about things like reparations and other resources, for me, there are certain things that are just non-negotiable. Um, and I, as a um, commissioner and also doing this work on the national level, am a strong advocate for, um, you know, we should not have to have a global pandemic for people to realize the importance of healthcare as a human right, right? And that goes not only for just um, immunization, but also, um, social and mental health resources and trauma resources and culturally community informed resources. And what I mean by that is um, people in Black Native American communities, they need to be able to go to, um, in many ways, in some circumstances, people who look like them to receive clinical support and resources. That is essential. Um, and as we move forward as a nation, we have to find out how to, we have to do this. Um, and center this as we move towards any remedies, right? So I think when we talk about use terms like reparation and things like that, we have to be very specific, but also we have to recognize that it's more than that. And it's this gets into your social transformation piece, the um, parts of the, something that we, we talk about a lot of in, in our work. It has to be a holistic change and a plan that is mapped out in partnership, being led by those on the ground, right? I went off on a tangent a little bit. You can bring me back. There was another question I think you asked me. I'm sorry. No, this was all very important though. I think it would it would also be interesting for people to hear the origins of that. Cause I believe that that commission is the first of its kind in the country, one focused yeah. specifically on lynching. So if you wanted to share, everything you shared was beautiful though. So it was important. Thank you for sharing it. No worries. So yeah, our commission was really started on again, grassroots. Um, on the grassroots level. For years, there have been people in local communities um, around the state, specifically one of the longer, longest communities that's been doing this work, the earliest communities um, in Salisbury, Maryland, um, specifically around the George Floyd killings. Um, there were, um, you know, there was interest in making these connections, right? These com Black communities and communities of color have always been seen these connections. Um, again, I think it's a privilege to be able to detach and say that, you know, in many ways, when you know that um, there's racial animosity and racial issues in, in communities or municipalities, it's privilege that tells you that, you know, this is only, um, those things are in the past, right? And so for most communities, they've always been there. And so early on in Maryland, Again, um, the community in Salisbury, which is where I focus and my work on as a commissioner, um, they um, began to do this work um, um, in around the time that Trayvon Martin was um, killed. Um, but there's also been really groundbreaking historical work that needs to be highlighted, um, specifically in Maryland. And that's through the Maryland um, State Archives, which um, it, it has a legacy of slavery project that was um, first started by Dr. David Taft Terry, um, but it also, um, it eventually was led, it is currently led by um, Chris Haley, who is the um, nephew um, of Alex Haley. Um, 
And obviously Chris is a friend of the Baha'i um, community and works with, have worked with you all before, as well as Maya Davis, great friends of mine, both commissioners. Um, you know, and their historical work um, is so essential. And it's essential because again, Maryland, when we think about it, is not typically a state that's looked at in terms of its history of racial terror lynchings. We only know of 43 documented lynchings. And so as a historian of racial terror lynching, in addition to doing activism, I know that the majority of the focus is on the Deep South, Mississippi, um, Arkansas, other areas, and not so much the uh, Deep South, Georgia, et cetera. And because of that, other states have gotten a pass in many ways historically and in terms of confronting the issues of racial terror. Um, and I, for us in Maryland, um, the, the, the communities in Maryland, um, they could not allow the state to get a pass on its history, specifically when we saw what happened and have continued to see what's happened in the state at, around issues of um, anti -black, systemic anti-Blackness. And the major case for a lot of these communities, um, everything came home really with the Freddie Gray incident. Um, and what people don't know is a few, I would say about less than 20 minutes from where Freddie Gray was murdered, there was a lynching um, in then um, Baltimore, um, right in the Baltimore, now it's Anne Arundel County, but it was Baltimore then. Um, and so like these connections have to be made and we have to understand that there is a direct line between the racial terror lynchings and anti-Black violence of old with what we see today. Um, because at the end of the day, what's happening is that at the root of it is this dehumanization. And you don't see human beings at a certain point, you, be, you see bodies. And that is something that again, all citizens, we all are guilty of as a part of the institution um, and how we function and operate. And I think the, the, the task in dismantling that is for local communities. I don't care if you've had two or three issues of racial violence or lynchings, right? It, it doesn't matter, they're all equally um, important and they need to be understood um, specifically as communities um, jump on this bandwagon of sorts that's emerging post George Floyd and post COVID around confronting systemic racism. Um, and I think we do have to be careful in this political moment that we're in. We've always been in political moments. However, um, communities are tired of being sick and tired as uh, I believe Ella Baker said, right? Um, and so either we can, either the communities are gonna continue to do the work as I mentioned, or it, you know, if the government or other institutions don't come correct, um, they can do the work on their own because there are a number of corporations who are willing to do some of this work and who have already committed to doing it, they'll be held accountable as well. But the, the long and the short of it is um, we can no longer wait um, to get things done in this country. And we really have to um, advocate, always advocate for our people and really connect on this and deal with this shared humanity piece, highlight that. And I keep saying that, but you know, until we recognize as a people when, we, when you hear, I think what was so unique about George Floyd's situation um, was his cry for his mother, right? That is a very human thing. And in many ways, whenever that happened, um, those who oftentimes who could turn, turn the television or not really look at these things or experience these things the way they did, specifically white Americans during this time, um, the, the thing about the pandemic, what it did, most of us all were at home, right? It, it is, as privileged as we were, as many nannies as we had, in some cases, we all had to watch, all, watch our kids, right? And raise our children and it, as if we haven't been doing so before. I know for me, having to do that as well was difficult. But I think, you know, for those who weren't used to these issues or could, who had privilege to ignore them previously, they could no longer do that because of COVID. And it showed us that when, um, it's unfortunate, as I mentioned, that um, it shouldn't take those type of incidents to happen for us to see each other's humanity. However, we, that is the case. And um, it was his cry for his mother, that human cry, that I do believe has really led to a shift that is led, is coming from the ground within this country and that's moving towards a racial reckoning. But it's going to be up to the coalition and the people um, to push this forward. We can't expect politicians um, to do this. 
for sure we cannot expect politicians to do this Definitely. it'd be scary i have to i want to add something before you ask your next question about the canadian trc what i really admire oh man those guys had this system down pat in terms of how they did this, um, I t was an honorary witness, which meant that I was invited to come and, and um, witness. And then I was asked to reflect what I saw and heard. And then I have a lifelong title of honorary witness. As per that's how I was instructed that what an honorary witness means. So to carry this experience and retell the, to retell the experience. But so the one I attended was in Montreal. It was a public event, probably 500 people in the room. The three commissioners are there and individuals came. I, I watched three, three days of 15 minutes each person had to share their testimony. Um, Jumbotron, just so everybody could see, translated from six different languages that were spoken, some of them tribal languages in French and, and whatever other languages there are there in Canada. Um, the testimonies, they had a spiritual person on the stage where this all took place with them. You, can you could tell that they had been working on a lot of them, working on a lot of healing because, by the way that they spoke so that even though there was emotions when they shared, um, they were they were okay. And so so anybody in Montreal could come, anybody, any citizen. I thought that was amazing. And the if the the individuals could share on this system with before the commissioners, they could share anonymously uh, in recording or written. They could uh, be recorded also and let people know, but give it to just one person. They could do it in a talking circle and the talking circle was recorded. So they gave them all these different options of how they would uh, offer their testimony. The uh, If in the large hallway where people were going from one room to the next, uh, if someone was crying or or you, they could tell was uh, starting to have that intense feelings. They were surrounded by the mental health and spiritual workers who were part of it and were uh, everyone had to walk around and just let them be. And they sang and nurtured and took care of that individual right then and there. It was an incredible, incredible. Uh, so what, when I saw that after doing our little circles and then seeing that, I went, we, I know we can do this. And I know that it's the voice of those who experienced whatever it is that we're looking at that has the power. It's one thing to retell something that's good, but until, unless you hear the testimony from the individual, that to me is, is where the power lies. Thank you so much. And I wanna begin to bring in some of the questions from our audience who's watching. Um, the first question is, is it helpful to consider reconciliation as an outcome of one, speaking the truth, two, the collective recognition of truth, and three, repair as a response to acknowledging the true depth of the injury? Can there be reconciliation without repair? No, simple answer. Next question. <laughs> Straight into the point. Thumbs we don't need to discuss it. I'm serious. Oh, Charles. No time. No air. So let's go on to the next one. I think we also spoke about it a bit this morning too. So it's nice to be able to include a few other questions. So we'll continue on to the next question. It said, thanks very much to both of you for your work and for being here today. This was touched on a bit, but can you elaborate on what you have observed and experienced around the role of moral and spiritual qualities in the truth and reconciliation process, including empathy, humility, grace, perseverance, and resilience? To my, to my earlier point, it, they have to be centered, but I think really the community um, being a part of that process, those, um, those um, tools um, are, are going to be really birthed out of the communities, right, as you engage them, right, specifically um, with various religious traditions and communities that are involved. We feel that they, um, communities of faith, have to be involved at the local level in this work. Um, and so for us, we really um, lean on the 
needs of the community in that regard. But I do think to a larger point, as we as a commission look at um, laying out and developing a framework or, or modeling um, a design for how we do our um, actual hearings, um, we are actually really leaning on the advice of spiritual leaders and others, um, specifically around developing a space that is indeed in many ways sacred um, that will provide um, communities uh, uh, with this opportunity to share their truth in a, a safe way, right? Um, recognizing the trauma that these institutions have um, inflicted upon these communities. And uh, yes, and yes, and yes. Um, we use our spiritual practices in laying a foundation for the day to honor and hear what's being shared and to take care of individuals. So for us, it's a specific kind of way that we would do that. And our guests that are invited in can participate or not, you know, participate whatever is comfortable for them. Um, most of our participants find our medicines that we use and the songs that we use uh, very healing themselves. And, and uh, like, so for instance, the circle I talked about where that uh, social worker was at the end of our day, um, we have a healing circle and that's for everyone. And you can't go into this and say only certain people can, we're only going to comfort certain people. We're only going you can't invite individuals in and be unwilling to take care of them just as much as you're taking care of your community because they're there to listen and to hear and to probably looking for something that they can do different. So we, um, we will offer that. I wanted to share too, um, oh, now I just left my brain. It'll come back with something about Canada. Oh, this is just fun little side note about the place where this, in Montreal, where this incredible three-day truth and reconciliation took place was in the same hotel that John Lennon and Yoko Ono had their bed in. Only people my age probably are hip to that, where they stayed in bed. They were going to stay in bed until the war was over. But anyway, nevertheless, I thought, well, how fitting is that? You know, what kinds of what kinds of prayers and visions were laid down during that time when we were trying to tell the government this is not our, we should not be involved in this. But anyway, thought that was interesting. This is for both of you as they've been so far. If if your work is successful, what will be the nature of the change in American society 50 years from now? And I had a similar question around like, what because we're talking about truth, healing and transformation and we've touched on it a little bit, but maybe we can explore more the nature of the transformation that we're we're working towards. Well, I would say for our community, and I'm only speaking about child welfare right now, there are other issues, of course, that are important in the, in terms of justice, you know, certainly, um, you know, police and, and housing and everything. But I'm just going to say, and then maybe this could be a model for the other, other areas, but if, if a true reconciliation, a true transformation, a true um, process of justice happened in child welfare, Indian child welfare, it would be focused solely on family preservation. And then you say, well, you got that Indian Child Welfare Act. What more do you need? Well, currently in Minnesota, Native children are the high, have the highest rate of removal in the nation. We know that there's a, an, a bias toward addictive parents. We know that there's a bias toward brown parents. We know that a lot of this exists. We know that unconscious bias really impacts decisions social workers make. Um, so what would, what would transformation look like is the social worker upon meeting a family would say, what happened? What happened? Can you tell me? As opposed to, why'd you do that? What's going on? You know, a more, the whole system would be geared around how do we help these individuals, these families that are you know, in pain, in crisis, and with the approach would be completely different. Removal's not an option. And then you're going to say, well, there has to be, there's meth houses. Well, I am not talking about that, obviously. I am talking about the unnecessary um, 
And, and it's more than that. We have more unnecessary removals than we do actually have the imminent harm and danger situations. Those are so few and far between. And so the other thing I see that I feel would be helpful is it's, it is challenging working with individuals who are in crisis, the emotional crisis. They're locked in shame. And it's a real, it's difficult to reach individuals to reach the essence of who they are when they're locked in shame. So social workers need uh, a support along the way too. I see you, uh, uh, somebody who's like that support person could say, you know, you're starting to get really mad at this family. That's not going to help. So let's take a step back. Nobody's there helping that individual go into this crisis situation. They come back, they may talk about it, but there's nothing that's focused on. We're losing sight of how we help this family. We're losing sight on how, how we can preserve this family. Our MAT programs, mothers, um, the uh, treatments for uh, pregnant mothers has been really successful. The White Earth Nation has an exceptionally successful program and they have it in, in, in the city as well. And that's what it's focused on. The workers are, are hyper-focused there. And unless you work in and around social work, you don't see, and this is not a judgment on social workers by any sense. It's just a human reaction to get fatigued, to get frustrated and lose sight. Nothing wrong with that. So how do we help them help the family? That's a transform transformative way of approaching child welfare instead of the punitive approach that exists right now. I think for me, again, going back to the shared humanity piece, what we really need is systemic change, right? And this is why I think when we see efforts such as those that Sandy is doing, we have to see them also holistically and see that they're part of other existing issues as well that have to be dealt with. I think that's why Sandy's point was originally, um, what was, that she just made was important, where she talked about, okay, you have this one commission, oh, but now why do you need this? That's always the case, right? Um, but um, for those of us who, uh, and for those of us who are connected to communities who understand that these things are complicated and they're systemic, we, we have to recognize that whatever change we seek um, in 50 years has to be holistic and it has to be inclusive and really it has to really deal with um, the root. Because again, to my earlier point, if we don't, you know, we can have a piecemeal approach and focus only on education, right? But then forget um, and overlook um, um, police brutality, right? Or um, food deserts or, I mean, these are the things that um, we're kind of up against and we have to make sure that we're not careful because again, a lot of what we're dealing with now at the, in this current phase, we've always dealt with is, all, is the, the ways in which um, politics are at play. And so I, I always think we have to be cognizant of that and 50 years from now, I would hope that we are moved forward as it relates to um, acknowledging and understanding the shared humanity of every individual, um, specifically um, in the United States, but also um, uh, globally as well. I wanted to just say, with, with the last comments that you made, Charles, reminds me of how, how uh, African-American people were first portrayed, the words, the images first used, and the uh, words and images used about us. And those words and images still exist today within, um, within dialogue. They, they really do. Uh, anyway, so until those disappear or when they're brought up, people are saying, wait a minute, no, um, that, that's, not going, that's not going to change. But the system change that needs to happen needs to, um, those that make, can make that decision, they need to be invited to our circles and they need to be brought in because unless they see you know, because it could just appear to them as another complaint. They're not, they're not understanding. They're like, as, um, you know, I like how Charles said that, that shared humanity, unless they see that, what motivation do you have to change anything? You have to be motivated to change something. Definitely. We're, 
the questions are pouring in now, so I'll continue on. Projects and initiatives that seek to tell the truth of historical and contemporary injustices are taking many forms today, from formal commissions to academic research to journal journalist coverage to less formal processes. What can all of these efforts do? What can all of these efforts do to open the hearts and minds of those who may not yet see the need to learn about these truths or who might be afraid to face these truths? In other words, how can we continually expand the circle of those who are listening and learning? You have to speak the truth on the regular and you have to speak and point out wrongs on the regular. You can't just say, oh, I'm gonna to go to this commission and then that's where it's at. It has to be regularly. When you're in the break room and you hear something that's really shitty, the reason that they can continue to say that is nobody says anything. The reason, and, and or uplift somebody. Hey, you're doing awesome, way to go. Uh, but until people speak up and speak out, nothing, that, that, that has to happen as well. So we can't rely just on, we can't rely just on, well, I went to this circle, now I've, you know, you, you benefit from it, but then you gotta share the benefit and you've gotta, you've gotta speak it, you've gotta be it. That's what me being an ally is you know, also is, is saying that. So we have to do it on the regular. We got to do it on a daily basis. Um, that's until it changes. I have a lot of hope for my grand, our grandchildren's um, generation because they speak up. They, they're, they're not as beat down as we were, you know, that plus because of our healing initiatives that we've had in our communities, we have a lot of sobriety. We are the most abstinent culture group that exists right now. And while we still have issues, you know, it's not like we don't have them. It's not everybody like it was back in the day who were medicating what happened to them. Our grandchildren are blowing us away at what they're doing and saying at age 14, which was usually the onset of using age for most of us that are in our late 60s. And their, their mind is intolerant of anything other than balance and truth. So I got a lot of hope for that things will, will change. They'll be able to come along and pick up some of the things that we've laid down and take that to another level. Yes, I'm encouraged by the younger generation as well to your earlier point. And I think also it's important that you recognize, that we recognize what you also mentioned like, you know, it's important to look at, um, you know, what is academic work, the work of journalists, but it's really the day-to-day -day work that Sandy is talking about. Like when we go to our jobs, right? And I think this is what, um, where we're at in terms of looking, when we talk about transformation, we have to be able to understand and have conversations and make space for the communities um, and conversation and dialogue um, outside of um, you know, these various um, circles or whatever we decide to do in terms of the commission. It has to, commissions oftentimes, what we talk about in terms of, in our commission is that they have a, a, a timeline and something has to happen when they're, when they're over. And for us, we see that um, we have to provide tools for communities to be able to take these back with them, as well as municipalities and, and governments who are serious about supporting this type of change an infrastructure and tools that can help these efforts be sustainable um, is something that's important. But I couldn't agree with you more, Sandy, around, um, you know, around the water cooler, having these conversations, but also something that I think is important is the way that corporations and businesses and institutions really have to start uh, making sure that um, communities impacted by a lot of what we're seeing on TV and the communities that have historically been impacted, that they're provided with resources that they need um, to, to get through um, what, we, what we've been witnessing for the past two, um, two years and even before that, right? Um, I think we're at a unique moment to where um, corporations and institutions um, are, now they have to listen to the trauma because there's money tied to this in many ways. Um, and we have to look at that and not be afraid to say, I need, as my niece um, says, a mental health day, right? After, after witnessing, it's interesting when we think about issues like, you know, what we saw see going on at Standing Rock, what we saw with George Floyd, all these things that communities of, of color are 
in marginalized communities see the saturation. We're expected to come to work as if everything's fine. Do you have the report that we asked for? And it's like, right? And so for me, I think I've embraced this, um, this, this freedom now in from the younger generation of being honest and saying, you know, I have leave. I'm going to take my leave because I need a day, right? And um, having conversation with leadership and others saying that, um, you know, you can't just ask, you can ask me for a report, but, um, you know, we have to figure out a way to check on my person first and my emotions and how I'm doing, because we're, we're all seeing what we're seeing on TV, right? But some of us, um, in, most of us in power or those in power have the privilege of separating those things, but people such as uh, me and Sandy and others of color don't have that privilege. Yep, and, and for us, our community, I, I understand the importance of reports too. I understand the importance of research. I have a research team, I'm all about it, but I also see it as a deeply flawed mm, pacifier. Mm -hmm. um, we don't, our oral histories are as valid as something written down. Our community has community intellectuals that live within those communities who are not tapped for, uh, are not even considered a consultant. Are you kidding? We can't pay that person for their knowledge. God forbid they don't have their degree in whatever. That is such BS. I'm being. I'm gonna be nice and not start cussing because right when I get in this area, I just want to cuss and just rip people, because just think of the individuals. Well, I know Charles does, and May I'm sure, and PJ. We know who those in community intellectuals are. We if we go to them to get what we need to for us to keep doing what we're doing. But why are they not? seen as the experts with the expertise why are they not um you know tapped for that you know we in our community well i remember chris used to as the mentor who brought me into this work we'd have a lot of people contacted that were getting their phd and stuff and they were good kids wasn't anything he'd say nope I'm not giving you an interview he says i gave you an interview you write it down and you become the expert Never mention my name, never say, you'll just say an elder. And that's really true. And so, and for this process to happen in the best possible way, it's our community members who know how that would best happen within their community. Can't be the outside person that comes in can provide a something part of that structure. Okay, well, we got money to give you guys for some food. We got you know, well, we got to yeah, rent a space. We can do that. Then, then the community uh, does it work with not thinking that sh you should lead. That kind of audacity just blows me away. I don't get that. I don't know where it comes from. I don't know if it's in people's DNA. I don't know. Yeah. But somehow, yeah. Go ahead, Charles. Well, no, I just think, Sandy. First of all, me and you are gonna we're gonna become friends because listen, this is. Whenever you you said that about you know how people come in the report when I when I heard report I just kind of cringe right because it's always been used right so if we have the report then you'll now you can talk about doing some systemic change and addressing our people's concerns it's always have the again the master's tools right having everything this is how it's done here so if you want to you have a grievance we need you to come up with the report we understand that your the trauma has been passed down in your community we understand you have. You know, but we, the oral histories are good, but we need the data, right? And it's like, and, and then once you get data, then what? And I think at this point, you know, Marcus Ritterker talks about, um, he's the author of Slave Ship. Um, he talks about a human story and moving beyond the abstractions. And I think for pe people in our situation and from our communities, we're beyond that, right? We, we if the, our human story is valid enough alone, our oral histories are valid to your point alone. And, you know, we, we will get the data and we'll get it. But at the end of the day, um, justice is going to be done. Right. And I think that is kind of where we're at with it. But I, I agree with you wholeheartedly around, you know, this issue of reports and how academic institutions in many ways have historically been a part of the problem. Yeah. Right? And we've got to acknowledge that we have to. Yeah. They, I, I got to share this too. Hopefully nobody's, well, I don't care if they're on here. Um, 
I was invited to speak at this conference on reconciliation. And I got really salty at by the after I realized I was the only person presenting that has been part of a circle. And so they had all these academics, you know, and then I was put on a panel, not given time to talk, talk, you know, to explain, tell the story. You know, and I remember telling the young man who invited me was really kind, kind young man. And I told him, I said, man, I said, you guys, do you see what you just did? What the hell? And you had all these people come and listen to you and you not one of you has ever been in a community and you called this a reconciliation conference. I forget what university that something out, somewhere out east. And then I teased him and said, figures, it's out here that it would happen. First colonial thing, they you know that. <laughs> anyway, so we have to be, so people are going to want to own this. They're going to want to be seen as a status within this. And so we have to protect this process as well so that, you know, those that are wanting to be seen as whatever it is that status seekers seek, um, I don't get that part either. Uh, so we have to be careful of that and protect this process so that it stays um, a process of the people. And that, and I, and that report and things that have to happen, yes, mm -hmm. but within a construct of how of of redoing and and letting it um, marinate, and maybe in and maybe even when that report's written, you go back and you make sure you have a a, a sampling of that community present. You say, did we get that right? Does that was. Or what would you add? Because you always have more information after you've let something marinate a little bit and just always make sure it comes from the community. I agree. I wonder if we can squeeze, and we're very short on time, but I do wanna squeeze in one final question if we can. Um, this question is asking, can you speak to what happens in a community after such spaces? For example, have you seen institutions create opportunities for new patterns of engagement moving forward or channel the energies of the individuals and communities involved in harmonious ways? And I just want to pitch Sandy for you. There was an, another beautiful film that showcases your work. Blood Memory has ends with a scene of these adoptees returning home. And it's just a very powerful welcome home. It's an example of healing, an example of justice that a community can administer to um, its own people. So I wonder if you want to talk a little bit about that, but also however you want to answer the question. Yeah, Maine has really used the energy from the TRC to um, build allyship, number one, doing a lot of education around that. That I was really appreciative of that. Uh, I know that different segments of the community, uh, the non-Native community were really kind of baffled that about how they didn't know Maine history. And so I recall being at one of the community uh, report backs was uh, there were several uh, instructors, I believe they were high school instructors present and they, they went up on a, up top of the area that we were talking in. And finally I go, hey, what are you guys doing? <laughs> It was all huddled. This is a public thing. And I thought they were kind of like missing the point of what we were doing. And they go, well, we're trying to figure out how we could write a textbook that tells this history that we just learned. And I'm like, yes. So there's so many things that using your own gift and your own talent, it's not just up to the people that did the commission. That's when it, be it comes, becomes a collective work. Well, what can I contribute? Maybe I'm the person that's, that is in the coffee shop and says, ah, don't be talking like that. That's not, you know, don't underestimate how powerful that is even. But um, they, they opened up work in the prisons more. They, there's many things. And if you go to their website, you can see a lot of the work. They call it beyond the mandate. And it just lists a lot of their work. There will always be people that are frustrated and want more. Like Canada has the same same issue they they had 300 plus recommendations you know where do you start and find find a starting point but the rea but the point is that um testimonies were given testimonies were recorded 
and uh, findings and, and, and recommendations were given. So there is this document that will always be upheld because it was a mandate between these two entities and you can always use that to, to continue work. So people changed small, I think small changes are just as important as the systematic ones because um, it's, it's start, it, as Chris always said to me, unless the grassroots people hold on to something and want it to go forward, it's not going to be successful. Thank you so much. We, um, Charles had a hard out at four. We were so fortunate that he was able to join us. We are so, so thankful and appreciative to you and to Charles for, uh, for being here today, for sharing the incredible work that you're doing. Um, we tried to share as many links as possible to your work and to some of the things that we referenced in the chat so that people can please visit it after and learn more about this and engage in this work. Um, but thank you, thank you again so much, Sandy, and to Charles for making the time and for being with us this afternoon. I want to ask a question. Did mm -hmm. somebody write something about the church in one of their questions? Someone did ask that question. We didn't get. I want to say something about that real quick. Having um, the having had the experience of the churches of uh, I shouldn't say a, a church's abuse. Uh, oh, I so I want to say it was not healthy Christianity, but. Um, I was also given a lot of hope when I was in Canada because they had the clergy come and, and offer testimony and statements as well. Some of them did the usual, if our organization ever hurts you, da, da, da. but the most powerful uh, acknowledgement I heard was from a pastor. I can't remember what denomination now. I got to look this up, but he said, he just came right out and said, we have betrayed you. We came to you offering, and he just went into this thing of, we are going to offer you clothing, food, and then we betrayed you and took from you, violated your bodies. And he just laid it out there. And he said, so not only did we betray you and ourselves, but we, we betrayed the very God who we said we represented. And it was so powerful. And it brought out so much, like you could almost feel this collective so, because he said it just so profoundly and so so truthfully so uh, churches I think are do need to be part of this uh, le leadership needs to be part of this as well because there is plenty of of uh, justice reconciliation healing that has to happen with that as that as well thank you very no, much for having you, me you guys Diana, thank you for taking the time to answer that question and thank you all thank you so much yeah. take care